Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome. Uh, my name is uh, Mahmoud Ahmed, and I represent the Aga Khan Foundation UK. It is our pleasure to be holding this webinar with John McConnell, editor of the Lancet Infectious Diseases Journal. But before moving on to our main subject, I should explain for the benefit of participants who may not be familiar with Aga Khan Foundation, uh, that it is one of the several development institutions that together comprise the Aga Khan Development Network, which is active in about 30 countries, including Central and South Asia, the Middle East and Africa, as well as in some parts of the industrialized Western world. Our mission as AKDN is to improve living conditions and uplift the quality of life of marginalized communities. So you can appreciate that we are centrally uh, absorbed with and are grappling with the current pandemic. We work in health uh, and uh, also in education and in uh, cultural matters globally, uh, always trying to improve uh, the quality of life. In health, we run one of the largest not-for-profit treatment systems globally, transforming healthcare systems, uh, as well as training hundreds, if not thousands, of uh, midwives, nurses, and doctors. In education, we own and operate over 200 schools and educational programs in 13 countries for 85,000 students, three quarters of them in a rural setting. So we're using creative ways to sustain learning in these contexts, often where there is no internet, uh, using, for example, pick up and drop off points for learning assignments. Our work in the economic sector is to create jobs and improve skills, essentially develop the economy. So let me say that that says to you something about the Aga Khan Development Network and about the Aga Khan Foundation. I wanted to introduce to you our speaker today, John McConnell. You've read something about him on the material that was put out. Uh, so we know that he studied microbiology and parasitology in the UK and was for six years at the world famous uh, Royal Postgraduate Medical School in Hammersmith, which is now part of Imperial College. And in 1990, he joined The Lancet. He was the first editor of the journal's website in 1996, and in 2001 became the founding editor of the Lancet Infectious Diseases. So John, I see you're about to hit your 30th anniversary with the Lancet, which is quite, uh, quite an achievement. Yeah. Now the Lancet, a few days time. the Lancet itself, I'll tell you something about that as well, is a, is a monthly journal of original research, review, opinion, and news covering international issues relevant to clinical infectious diseases or disease specialists worldwide. It is in fact ranked first amongst infectious disease journals uh, and is recognized for providing a global authoritative and independent forum for the highest quality infectious diseases research and opinion covering such areas as the treatment and research of HIV AIDS, antibiotic resistance, emerging infections, and public health. So that tells you something about our um, very famous and uh, expert uh, um, on this subject. I, I'm going to move to questions and answers, but before I do that, may I just uh, mention to our audience that at any time during this webinar, you'll have the opportunity to submit your questions. To do so, just type your question into the Q&A, which you'll see the icon for at the bottom of the control panel. And time permitting, John will address as many questions as he can at the end of the seminar. Now we are going to be uh, recording the seminar and we'll share the link after the event. So now before we turn to you, John, with our first question, could I just ask um, our organizers to put up on the screen a poll? I'd like to take a quick poll of everybody who's uh, participating and uh, you'll see the poll question come up on the screen and I'd be grateful if you could answer it in the next uh, minute or so before we close the poll. And the question is, do you currently wear a face mask in indoor or enclosed space interactions 
with people not from your household? You just have to answer yes or no. And uh, you can do so, obviously, at any time in the next little while. So, John, if I can um, move to you with our first question, I just wanted to ask you, first of all, would you say that there has been a sufficient drop in infections in the UK to warrant an easing of lockdown? Yeah, uh, great question. And um, thank you, everybody, for, for joining. Um, I see we've got uh, almost 150 people in the audience now. Um, so, um, yes, um, there has definitely been a, a, a drop in this thing called the R number, the reproduction number, um, and it seems to have remained at, at one or below now for, um, um, for a few weeks. Um, so that, that's sufficient incentive to start easing lockdown. What I um, am concerned about is um, easing too many of the, um, uh, what are known as, um, I mean, lockdown's one word for it, or um, social distancing or physical distancing, but it, a more general term is, is uh, non-pharmaceutical interventions. Um, so those, those include things like, of course, uh, face mask wearing and, um, and washing your hands. Um, I, I'm concerned that we do too many things at the same time. Um, and uh, if we ease too many conditions at the same time, and there is, unfortunately, uh, an uptick in the number of cases, um, then we, we can't be clear about what it is that's changed, um, which has led to that uptake, uh, uptick in cases, it, should it happen. Um, so I, I, would, I would prefer to see, uh, although I'm uh, just like all the rest, everybody else, I'm sure, um, I, I'm keen to see lockdown ease. Um, I, I would have done it in a, um, a slightly more step-by-step -step approach. So in, in that context, you know, there's been a lot of discussion about face masks and uh, we've asked a question to our audience on that, on that point. Um, and uh, I uh, wanted your thinking about these face mask um, issues. I mean, clearly I think it is now more or less accepted wisdom, uh, which wasn't always the case. And I'd like you to just throw some light on what has been the reason for the change in the position. I had understood that the World Health Organization were originally saying that face masks were not that important. Uh, now everyone seems to be saying they are very important. And I'd like you to tell us something about some of the practical uh, points yeah. about face masks. Yeah, so I think the reason that the uh, WHO changed its position there, and as a result, governments around the world have been changing their position, is my colleagues at the, the Weekly Lancet Journal published a um, systematic review um, of various non-pharmaceutical inter interventions. And one of the conclusions of that review is that um, face masks did have some effect in reducing the transmission of the disease. Now, the caveat to that uh, conclusion was that the, um, the level of evidence was, was pretty weak. Um, it was uh, not based on, on randomized trials. Uh, because there just simply have not been randomised trials of um, um, of face mask wearing in the uh, in the COVID nineteen situation. So um, the evidence that has was used has been based on uh, previous outbreaks such as the um, uh, flu uh, pandemic uh, of eleven years ago, um, SARS, that that sort of thing. Um, but anyway, the, the advice has changed. Um, I've, I've moved the position from being incredibly sceptical of the value of face masks um, to thinking that they, uh, that they might actually have a role in the situation we are in now, uh, which is where more, instead of being separated out, instead of us being all in our homes and rather thinly spread, uh, in the situation where uh, lockdown is eased and we start to come together, um, and uh, I think the face mask could have a role in um, when traveling on public transport, but, but more importantly, um, in public indoor situations. I think the, the chances of trans disease transmission on public transport are quite low compared with the uh, work environment, for example. And I mean, is there, is there much to be said about this distance of two, two meters? We talk about social, like social yeah. at two meters. How, how, can we, how much more relaxed can we be about <laughs> that distance? If well, we I think the, that? yeah, again, um, the, the best evidence comes from this same systematic review. Um, and um, it, it, uh, I think the conclusion of the review was that one meter was the absolute minimum um, because we are, the disease is being spread so, so primarily the disease is being spread by people. You need people to carry it around. 
and people spread the disease when they are um, when they are uh, expressing virus, and that virus comes out in uh, it can be during just re regular conversation. It comes out in droplet forms, and those droplets probably fall to the ground. Most of them fall to the ground within a meter. Um, but they they may be um, uh, trans uh, can be transmitted up to um, uh, up to two meters, perhaps even more. So it's it's just a question of risk. Uh, you are you are reducing your risk um, of transmission the, the, the further you you stand um, from from somebody who is infected. But but don't get the impression that we are all kind of an infected person is is walking around with a kind of miasma. A virus hanging around them. It's that that's that's not the case. It is it is coming out of our our um, respiratory tract. So so the, the physical distancing uh, of a of at least a meter and two meters two meters is is better um, is a a sensible precaution to to limit disease transmission. Yeah, I mean I see that Denmark and Hong Kong, uh, particularly those two countries, maybe others, many others are reducing that distance quite significantly, mm -hmm. and I. I, does, that, does that suggest to you that we're likely to see a reduction in that distance fairly soon in, in our yeah. I, I, it's I think it's a bit of a mixed message here because if you start to say a metre, uh, then you're actually so close to people that the um, uh, the the, uh, the opportunity to touch them um, becomes much greater the closer you get to them. So I think there's a there's a difficult public health message. Uh, at the moment, but but if you are going to really start um, opening things like, if we're going to start sending all our pupils back to schools, um, if we want if we want uh, the majority of the population to return to the work environment, um, then that uh, two meter distance is is not sustainable forever. Right, interesting. Now I've got I've got the poll result actually. We've got a number. We've got nearly two hundred participants on at the moment, John, and. Uh, I uh, am very interested to see that 60% of the uh, participants today have said that they would indeed wear a face mask uh, in an enclosed situation. Mm -hmm. uh, so it looks like they're going to become prevalent, whatever the government says, in fact, and that appears to be a sensible thing to be doing. Something I, 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 as I said already, I've, I've moved to that position from my initial scepticism a few months ago. I think it's interesting that um, uh, we have uh, colleagues who work in our offices in China, and when they first went back into the office environment, they were required to wear face masks all day long. Uh, but that situation, that rule has now changed, and wearing a face mask is now voluntary. Uh, and of course, what has changed in China is that they do not have local chains of transmission. Um, and so I, I, I can't see that advice changing uh, while we do have uh, chains of transmission uh, in our country and uh, in countries around the world. But, but, but hopefully it won't be something that we'll have to do on a, on a prolonged basis. So let's let's move on. I mean, we, we, we are where we are, and there's been a lot of discussion in the media about a vaccine. And uh, I, can, I mean, one is, it's clear that there's a lot of international cooperation in vaccine um, design and uh, testing and so on and so forth. Um, but is this is the, is it is it predominantly cooperation between the various scientists trying to do, to find a vaccine? Or is there an element of competition? <laughs> um, I, I just wonder about it because I did pick up on some recent uh, media reports that uh, China, for example, there's some intelligence suggestions that they're not too thrilled about the West discovery of developing a vaccine before they do. Now, I don't know whether there's any truth in that, maybe pure speculation, but it led me to wonder about this issue of competition and mm -hmm. whether, uh, you know, which, what, what is likely to be, what is in fact the flavor of the global approach at the moment, and how yeah. optimistic are you that um, a vaccine will be eff effective in, in use, perhaps in some parts of the world, not everywhere, uh, before the end of this year? Yeah, well, I think there are, at uh, last count, what I saw last night, there were uh, uh, about 100 vaccine programs uh, oh. around the world, yeah, yeah. Um, and there are 10 vaccines, which I think have reached some um, clinical trials stage. Um, uh, the, um, the most programs um, of any one country, China has more vaccine development programs um, th than anyone else. 
Um, I mean, you will have heard of the uh, group in Oxford who are um, uh, producing a vaccine, and they they are using a um, what has become a pretty much tried and tested technology, uh, a technological approach which they've used with the um, uh, Ebola vaccine, for example, um, and also with the uh, a vaccine uh, against the a related coronavirus called MERS, um, and and so they have successfully developed. Uh, vaccines, or at least they've got past the initial uh, with, with the Ebola vaccine, they've got the um, um, they, they've gone all the way through clinical trials, uh, and with the MERS vaccine, they've done the phase one clinical trial. So there, there's a there's a fairly reliable technology, uh, at least being used in the, in the UK. Um, and then there are all sorts of variations upon the theme. There's all sorts of ways of doing vaccinology these days, most of which I don't understand, or as soon as I do understand, I forget ten minutes later. Because uh, it's all become, it's, it's gone way, way past the stage where you just grew up an awful lot of bug, and then you just, uh, and then you, um, um, and then you made it safe by denaturing it and stuck it into people. It's it's well, well, well beyond that level, that sort of rather crude level of approach these days. Um, there is some coordination. Um, so, for example, there's an organisation called CEPI, which is the uh, Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness Innovation, um, and they are um, they've been uh, in this the vaccine space for uh, potentially pandemic diseases for the last um, three four years or so, um, and they are coordination coordinating some of the vaccine efforts. Um, and uh, WHO, of course, importantly, has a, has a role in coordination. At the moment, I think it's more important that we have many programmes, some of which might come up with a, well, with a fruitful vaccine. Uh, that, then, uh, that, that's more important than it is to, to worry uh, yeah. about potential competition between groups. Yes, absolutely. My, my impression is that the UK and the US in China, the primary, but that, that's where we hear about most of this. What about Russia and France? Um, there, there, yeah, um, there's, um, there is some vaccine development programs in Russia. Um, that they've got a bit of a track record with flu vaccines in, in Russia. So they, they, do have, um, they do have some experience, some relevant experience. Um, I believe there's one or two programs in, uh, in India. Um, in fact, when I when I looked at the map last night of where vaccine development was taking place, the, the only continent that doesn't have uh, vaccine development that's going on at the moment is Africa. Um, so even, even in South America, which uh, Argentina, for example, appeared to have one or two spots on the map um, where they're, where they're uh, attempting va uh, vaccine development. Brazil, um, you know, a, a, um, a economies like that, where there is actually a, 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 um, a rapidly burgeoning um, uh, research community. Yes. Well, it's all very exciting, but I think people seem to be more or less saying that before the end of this year, there will be a vaccine. It may not have been, you know, distributed widely as widely mm -hmm. as we would like, but there will be a vaccine available before this year ends. Do you think that's a reasonable assumption to make? I, I think that's, uh, I, I, I would say 50-50 chance uh, of having a, uh, a, a vaccine available. Uh, but not widely available um, by the end of the year. I, th I think the, the technology is there to uh, produce a vaccine that, that should work. But of course, ev every disease is different, so we can't be certain. Mm -hmm. And what about what about the treatment? I mean, again, we 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 understand that there is no treatment, mm -hmm. and all that the hospitals and the uh, NHS and uh, all around the world, all they can do is to address the symptoms and help the body yeah. itself uh, try to sort of survive long yeah. enough to be able to uh, uh, beat off the virus. Yeah. Uh, is, is that, you know, there's not much said, at least I've not read much about any possibility of actual treatment. There's something about plasma therapy I've heard about, but yeah. nothing much more than that. Yeah, so, well, obviously the, uh, the hydroxychloroquine and the chloroquine story has caused a huge controversy and has become, uh, has become a political um, uh, event um, rather than a medical or scientific event. Um, the, the Lancet was, um, uh, was the subject of a, um, uh, of a, of a um, scientific fraud. Um, and was uh, had to retract uh, a paper last week, which showed that um, hydroxychloroquine was uh, people treated with hydroxychloroquine apparently showed that people treated with hydroxychloroquine um, were more likely to die than those not treated 
Uh, but as I say, that was a that was a fraudulent paper. Now, the fact that um, my colleagues at Lancet had to retract that paper does not mean that hydroxychloroquine works. Um, so uh, since then, the um, the big trial, which is going on, or therapeutic interventions, uh, the recovery trial, which is going on in the UK, has stopped recruitment to its hydroxychloroquine arm uh, because they've looked at the data and um, the survival rate for patients co uh, confirmed patients with a confirmed COVID-19 treated and not treated with hydroxychloroquine is almost exactly the same. Um, so hydroxychloroquine does not appear to be the uh, the drug to use. No. Uh, and the other, which has been much talked about, is a, an antiviral called remdesivir, uh, which was developed for initially for the treatment of uh, Ebola, in fact, but didn't, didn't really work in the the trials that were done in the um, uh, the Ebola outbreak in the Congo, which is now approaching its end. Um, so it is then repurposed for the treatment of, of COVID-19. Really, the jury is out on that, on whether it does work or not. Um, the Lancet has published a paper showing it doesn't. Uh, but then um, Tony Fauci, who's leading the, um, the, um, uh, the COVID response in the United States, said a few weeks ago at a press conference that he had preliminary data that it does work. So I, 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 I really don't know where we are with that. It's, it's, all, it's all a bit of a grey area. Mm. Well, I mean, we're going to come to, you know, the Congo developing world issues in a minute. But just staying with the UK, I want to, I want to ask you a question about the business of, uh, of uh, test, track and trace. I find this a little bit odd in some ways because the impression I have, which may be completely wrong, the impression I have is that test, track and trace is pr particularly appropriate when there is not widespread uh, transmission of this virus in the community. So you can, you know, you won't get overwhelmed by the number of cases. Yet this, the government seems to be very keen on, on pursuing this and literally 25,000 people have been employed to run this. Um, is, it, is this something do you think that is actually going to be useful to us in this country and will it aim at elimination of the virus or what, what, is, it, what is the ultimate aim here? Yeah, well, elimination of the virus is a subject we could spend the next hour talking about because it's it's not a straightforward process. So I think the idea with tra test, track and trace is that when you reach a situation as where there are, where you don't uh, any longer have a, um, a nationwide outbreak, uh, which is risks overburdening the health system, but where you have a series of um, localised outbreaks, uh, which you can spot, um, and then you can run down those localized outbreaks by, by finding the contacts of infected people and asking them to um, to, to, to self quarantine. Um, so, uh, I mean, I think one of the mistakes that our government made was was giving up far too early on the test track and uh, trace policy, um, and, and they uh, they appear to have given up on that even before they imposed lockdown. Uh, and I, I think it, it has subsequently transpired that the reason for that decision is the UK just simply did not have the um, the testing capacity. Um, and you, you do wonder what the government had been doing in those the two months between the time when we knew that the virus was um, was a serious problem, a serious public health problem, um, and um, uh, and when um, it arrived in a substantial measure in the UK. So I, I think test, track and trace can work, um, but I, um, I, I, I don't think it can work while you have a generalized nationwide outbreak. So we may just be with the non-pharmaceutical non interventions uh, that we've imposed so far, we may just be about reaching the point uh, where it becomes a, um, a, a logistically um, viable thing to do. Are false negative tests a real thing to worry about? Um, you get yeah. a negative test, are you, are you relatively secure and relying on that? Um, well, um, so the uh, the testing is going to be um, the looking for the virus itself. So it's this so-called PCR test. So it's actually looking for the um, the um, the antigen, um, the, the virus. Um, and the issue with false negatives 
is, is not so much, it appears, not so much the test doesn't work, it's where you take your sample from. Um, so nasal pharyngeal swabbing um, actually requires sort of, you know, putting a sticking a cotton wool bud right up your nose to the back of your throat. And, mm-hmm. uh, and it's, a, it's a little bit uncomfortable, a little bit invasive, um, and it doesn't always get the, the, the sample you want, um, particularly if you're asking people to, to do it at home. Um, so I think the, the, the issue with the false negatives is probably more to do with the, um, the quality of the sample than the quality of the test. Yes, I mean, but can can we can we rely on the um, can we rely on the accuracy of the tests? I mean, would you yeah. say that they are more reliable than not? I mean, more than seventy five percent, eighty percent reliable. Uh, yeah, I, I I probably at least eighty percent. That's that's helpful. That's helpful. Um, all right. So you know, there are some countries. I mean, Sweden, for example, Pakistan might be another one. Brazil, I'm not sure about. There are some countries that have got a very I would say relaxed approach in some ways to mm-hmm. COVID-19. Um, I, I wonder about that and uh, whether you'd be able to sort of indicate whether that policy, I mean, Sweden particularly was a, a, a policy specifically decided as I understand it. In uh, other countries, it may not have been quite so premeditated, but that, that question about how it was approached and if you could also when responding to that, just Tell us a little bit about the predictability of this. Coming from where I am, really, from more from the sort of management and legal field, the thought that goes through my mind when I hear all this happening right now, it's all very well, we're trying to resolve a difficult situation, but was it not all very predictable? I, I can't get my head around how, uh, you know, we suddenly went into lockdown in middle of March, or soon after the middle of March, and it was all very dramatic. And yet in other countries, I mean, New Zealand comes to mind, British Columbia comes to mind. Uh, they all seem to have handled this in a very matter of fact way mm. and have come out very strong. And I'm a little bit surprised about the UK, which I, of course, I'm, I'm myself British and I, I, I think we have a fantastic system here. So I'm left a little bit sort of wondering how could we ever be in this situation? Mm. It's very odd. So, I mean, that, that, that question linked with what's happened in countries like Sweden yeah. and the United States and whether, you know, that's a better way to have gone, I don't know. Yeah. Well, Britain, of course, traditionally has a, has a very, very strong reputation in public health. Um, and we, we've been leaders in the field and we've been an example for, for many other countries. Um, I, I, I don't think we've been a shining example um, uh, during this. Um, it's all very well talking with the benefit of hindsight, um, but we probably should have locked down a couple of weeks earlier. Um, and that would have, might not have changed the absolute number of ca- uh, cases, um, but it might have changed the number of deaths if we'd been a bit more prepared. Um, you do have to ask what, what was happening um, in the space when, uh, about two months or so, when it became apparent that we were going to have a serious public health crisis. Um, at, uh, say, end of January, um, when the World Health Organization uh, declared a, um, uh, a public health emergency of international concern, uh, which should have uh, got galvanized governments around the world, uh, and the time when we uh, went into lockdown in, uh, I think it was March 23rd, wasn't it? Something like that. So the, the, uh, the contrast with Sweden is that they seem to take the decision to play a very long game indeed, a very long game. So, so let's not get the impression that the Swedes did nothing, because uh, that's, that's not the case. So um, they, um, they, they uh, cocooned the most vulnerable of their population, um, so told people who were elderly and vulnerable to, um, to, uh, to, to self, uh, uh, to, to quarantine. Um, they, uh, they didn't close their schools, but they did close, um, I believe, um, secondary schools and institutes of higher education. Um, they advised people who didn't have to go to work to not go to work. Um, and they um, limited the size of public gatherings. So, so, so it can't be characterized as a, as a do nothing approach. So, so their approach appears to have been sort of basically characterize, um, cocoon the most vulnerable, uh, but at the same time, um, let um, natural immunity uh, build up amongst other people. Um, and the justification for that, as, as their former 
chief epidemiologist, who's called Johan Gersica, said, is that he believes uh, that in a year's time, every country in the world will be in approximately the same place, um, wh whatever it is that we have done. However, where, where the Swedish approach now looks as if it didn't go wrong, uh, didn't go right, uh, is that they, they don't appear to have protected their, um, their care home population. Um, so they, they seem to be having the same sort of issues uh, with protecting the elderly and vulnerable in the care homes um, as, as we have been having. Um, so, you know, I, I think maybe that in that light, it, it actually makes um, the British response look, look even worse uh, in that we were much more radical with our lockdown, uh, but we still allow the, uh, the disease uh, to, to, to affect a far too high proportion um, of, our, of our care homes. Um, I wouldn't... Keeping I, our airports I, open, John, keeping mm, our airports open. Well, do you know what? There's, I, my conclusion on that is if we were going to close the airports and it was going to make a difference, then that had to be done at the end of January. Um, Any time after that, um, the, the, disease, the disease spread to this country. It's now very clear from data which emerged in the last 48 hours or so that the disease came to this country from, didn't come from China. China barely had a role in the disease arriving in the United Kingdom. It came, the initial surge of cases was from Italy, um, followed by Spain, followed by France. Uh, and that took place from mid-February um, until roughly the end of, uh, end of March. So if we were going to close our airports, we would basically have to have said, so, so the disease, my conclusion is the disease arrived and the, there were over 1,300 separate introductions uh, of the virus into the UK, which led to community outbreaks. Um, and we would have had to say, to say to people who were planning to go skiing, who were planning to take uh, to go away on half-term holidays uh, in mid-late February, we would have had to say, said to them, no, you can't go. Um, we, are, we are closing the airports. And we would have to have done that by at, at the latest mid mid February um, to make a difference. So you put the benefit yeah. of hindsight. Yeah, but well, can you imagine having done that in mid February? It would have taken a phenomenal political will. Yeah, but, yeah. But this is this is this is where I go back to my earlier point, which is about how predictable all this was. You know, I I, I must admit that the, I mean, if this were to happen again, sorry, man, but I've lost you for a moment. Ah, can you hear me? Um, are you are you still there? Hello. Uh, let me see if I can unmute you. Yes, you look like you're muted. Sanan, can you unmute John? But before John comes back, let me just say that the the if we no, we're not in the business of predicting. But if we were in the business of predicting, it would seem quite likely that the airport. Um, quarantine is not going to last very long. At least that's something which uh, would appear to be um, the indication from uh, all the public comment that's coming up on it. And in terms of livelihoods, you can see for the UK, John, are you back with us? Yes, yeah, sorry, I lost you there for a moment, was, but I'm, was, um, I'm, I'm just, back with you now. Yeah, and I was just commenting on this business about the airports. I mean, we're, we're talking about different countries approaches at different times. And mm -hmm. I was just saying that in terms of predicting what might happen in the UK, it would seem to me that the policy on quarantining airports is likely to be abandoned. I would say it's likely to be abandoned. Of course, we don't know. But if you look at it from the point of view of the, of the um, uh, lives versus livelihoods debate, the UK is so heavily dependent on the hospitality and entertainment industry, yeah. and tourism and all that goes with that. Uh, you yeah. know, at the airports in circumstances where the medical evidence, the scientific advice seems to be collectively that it's really not going to have that much of an impact. And uh, I, I, I don't think so. It's it's too little too late. Uh, and you um, you mentioned New Zealand earlier. I, I, I simply don't think it's fair to draw a comparison uh, between New Zealand and the UK. Uh, the, the New Zealand, uh, sort of two reasons, well, two or three reasons. New Zealand is, uh, has the population of, of Scotland spread over the country the size of, uh, of, of the UK. Um, it has only one um, um, conurbation which compares in any way to the conurbations uh, in the UK. But most importantly of all, and this is an absolute key factor uh, in the arrival and the re-arrival of the disease. Um, Britain is one of the most internationally connected countries in the world. 
and New Zealand just simply isn't. It's it's really really easy to keep people out of uh, out of out of New Zealand because basically they're only coming into one airport, yeah. um, and there's not that many of them. <laughs> well, um, that's a very good point. I mean, the same the same would apply, by the way, to British Columbia. Uh, uh, absolutely, that yeah. really. But even so, we do have a very difficult issue in the UK with a dense population, enormous movement in and out of the country, which leads me to. Uh, let's talk a little bit about the developing world, right? It's poor, it's densely populated, uh, social distancing is not practical in mm -hmm. India, in Pakistan, in Iran, in many countries in Africa, and lockdown it basically means starvation. Um, so so what are, what, what's your thinking on these countries? How are they supposed to cope with this yeah. situation at present? We rich countries can afford the lockdown, they can't, so what do they do? Yeah. Yeah, um, I think it's just worth it, uh, just as an aside, just before we get into that in more detail, just mentioning Africa. Mm. Um, and uh, um, uh, it, it is intriguing that, that the uh, epidemic has, has, has not appeared to take off uh, in Africa so far uh, in the way that it certainly has in, uh, in Europe and the, and the Americas. Um, uh, and it, it's... Um, I think there are no clear answers to that. Might be something to do with the age structure of the population. Uh, we don't know, but but that's certainly a. Um, uh, I, I think that still remains a substantial area of concern, uh, as, as we cannot afford to be um, to be relaxed uh, about how the uh, epidemic might might um, evolve in Africa. Um, as you say, that there is a very fine balance here uh, between the uh, plunging people into extreme poverty. Um, and limiting the spread of disease. So Pakistan has already felt that it, that, that it was too close to that line um, and has gone back to reopening the economy uh, but, um, because they just simply could not afford to um, continue to financially support the, uh, the poorer sections uh, of the community. Um, and uh, they've already been urged by the, um, the WHO to rethink uh, that policy because of the, uh, the, the burden of the disease on the, on the health service. So it's, it's an incredibly hard decision to make. The a very recent uh, World Bank report suggested that um, COVID would, um, would throw a roughly 60 million people around the world in, into extreme poverty. Um, and... Um, I don't know. I, I, I don't know where you draw the line between disease prevention uh, and, um, and uh, people's livelihoods, because um, there is absolutely no doubt about it uh, that poverty itself is a cause of premature mortality. Yeah. Well, this is very much an interdisciplinary matter, isn't it? It's mm, not it's very much so. Epidemiologist, but I think the one thing that we can do, the one thing that we can do is a, a, a really concrete thing we can do is that when, hopefully, when we do have a vaccine available, then that vaccine, vaccines, hopefully, must be equally available to everybody who needs it around the world. Now how do we make sure of that? Um, you will need some sort of central purchasing mechanism. Um, and there are models for that within the, um, um, the, the GAVI, uh, the sort of GAVI type framework. So the, the Global Alliance for Vaccines and Immunization. Um, they, they have been, um, they've been financing the vaccine programs um, around the world for uh, about 20 years now. Uh, and of course, uh, the, the, uh, the, uh, the virtual conference in London uh, a week ago, uh, then Gavi was refinanced to the tune of, I think, about, uh, about nine, uh, nine, nine billion dollars. Mm -hmm. Now, um, that money would, would not be used um, for a, a COVID-19 vaccine program. But that, that sort of Gavi, Gavi know-how uh, needs to be used uh, to have uh, central purchasing and distribution mechanisms. Yes. I mean, having a precedent is obviously tremendously useful. But talking about precedents, I, I was really you know, unfortunately, very saddened to hear about the U.S. withdrawal of support from WHO. And there, well, it's, 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 it's a matter of uh, reality. They have withdrawn. What, what, what the, what's the implication of that? I mean, how, how is that going to affect um, the developing world particularly? Uh, how much dependent are they on WHO? Is this money that yeah. important? Um, well, it takes money. It takes away... Um, yeah about 15, I think 17% of the WHO budget. That's, that's, that's pretty crucial. Huge. 
Um, but, but of course, WHO is a, is a technical agency by and large. It, it provides advice and guidance um, and global coordination. It, it, doesn't, um, it doesn't primarily p- pump money um, into, um, um, in, into programs um, in uh, countries who, who can't afford to, um, to, to, to intervene themselves. Mm-hmm. Um, the, um, the impact will be, um, uh, I think the worst impact will be for, for the United States' global standing. Um, uh, you, you can't remove yourself from the organization which coordinates global health decisions and expect to have a say in global health decision, decision making. Um, but, but there is already uh, press reports of, um, um, of the United States attempting to row itself back from that position. So w- yeah. whether it uh, happens in practice um, or just in words, um, we, we remain, remains to be seen. Yeah. So what I'll do, um, I, 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 I've got many more points I wanted to raise with you, but I wanted to turn to our audience. There have been masses of questions coming in here. I wanted to take one from Rizwan Govinji, who's asking this question. He says, what about the likelihood of COVID being an ongoing, maybe annual occurrence requiring regular lockdowns? Yeah. Uh, how would the management of that be dealt with? I mean, would it be any different from what we see now? We have, can, we, can, we, can we more or less assume we're going to have rep- rep- repetitions of this lockdown? Mm. Well, unless we eradicate the disease, and I think that's highly unlikely, um, then we will have um, we will have repeated epidemics. Then now, uh, after the first couple of waves of disease, um, then we should have a substantial level of population immunity, and particularly if we have a vaccine, mm-hmm. then we will have a substantial, substantial level of population immunity, which means that re-emergence is likely to be more localized. Um, so if there is a need for lockdown, then um, optimistically, that would be on a much more localized regional basis uh, mm-hmm. than the nationwide lockdowns um, that we have at the moment. And um, so why would we have, um, so I, d- I don't think the bug's gonna go away. It's gonna, it's gonna remain at a low level in the community. Um, so why would we have reoccurrence? Why would we actually have an outbreak uh, rather than just sort of low-level endemic transmission? And the reasons we would have an outbreak are because um, there's a community of people who haven't been vaccinated, um, and we do need to, you know, we do need to worry about that. There, there is already issues about, around vaccine acceptance, um, and also, of course, there'll be um, new people will be joining humanity. You know, people will be born, um, and will join the group of people who have not previously been exposed. Um, to COVID. Now, fortunately, of course, kids do, do not appear to be, um, to be badly affected um, by this disease. So there, there's grounds for optimism uh, there that um, unlike uh, most um, infectious, uh, childhood infectious diseases, uh, at, le- this, at least this won't be one that will badly affect our children. So, so I'm taking the optimistic view here as um, uh, uh, bad news, I don't think we can make it go away entirely. Good news um, is I think that we can control it in the future without having to have uh, the, this major disruption to our lives that we, should, we, we experienced for the last three months. Yes, yes. Well, thank you very much for that optimistic uh, view, which uh, I must admit I, I, can, I can share, and that, that will seem to be the way people will learn from this and memories will, 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 will be long on this point. There's a question from um, Mariam Kurbani. I don't know where she is. Mariam Kurbani is asking a question. How safe is traveling on planes? Mm-hmm. Not many people have been traveling on planes recently, but many yeah. of us do, and it's a way of life for a lot of people, right? So, <laughs> you know, it's, uh, it's, it's really it's ground to a halt. Yeah. Whether it's holidays or whether it's work. Yeah. And I suppose for everybody, the key question is, is it safe? Yeah. Um... I have not seen any confirmed examples of disease transmission taking place on, place on planes. Mm-hmm. Now that could well be, is there, because um, air travel has substantially halted um, uh, in large parts of the world, it could be that that's just because there have not been sufficient events 
there's not been sufficient exposure um, for us to actually measure um, and see if it see if it, it, it is a risk factor. Um, so I um, the difference between, of course, the um, the uh, ventilation system on the air conditioning, if you want to call it, on a plane, uh, and what you get in a building is that in planes, of course, they do recirculate some of their air, uh, which which should in a well ventilated building um, with air conditioning is, is not what should happen. Um, so th then there may be a higher risk uh, because of, because of that. Um, but but in general. Um, well-documented instances of transmission on public transport are few and far between. Right. Um, all right. Well, look, I mean, there are, there are so many questions here. I'm, I'm sort of, you know, quickly flicking through them to, to understand. I mean, this, this uh, hotspot, you mentioned about hotspots being perhaps a methodology for the future. Um, I mean, how... I, because we've got we're quite densely populated in the UK. I mean, mm -hmm. like going by you know the whole of London, or would it be parts of London? How would that? How would the hotspot? Be? Yeah. Um, yes, that that um, that is yet, yet to, to be determined. Uh, I mean, you you could you could imagine a, a borough wide lockdown, perhaps, but but then. Um, <laughs> Uh, our boroughs have very porous borders, so that's hard to imagine how that would uh, that would work in practice um, in, in London. Um, it, it would have to be a phased process, so you would you would have to do uh, uh, track and trace, of course, to um, to try and damp uh, down a, a localized outbreak, uh, and then if it got to the point where uh, it appears that track and trace was no longer working. Uh, then you would have to have some sort of cordon sanitaire uh, and say uh, and lockdown within that area. And of course, that is what happened in northern Italy. Um, is that they did cordon off uh, essentially. They did cordon off some some really quite um, um, some quite substantial communities uh, and say you know no travel within or out um, uh, except in extreme emergencies um, until we've got we've got this under control. Uh, but of course, the, the first intervention. Um, in that sort of situation, if we are in the situation where a vaccine is available, would be to vaccinate everybody, uh, including perhaps even those people who have already been vaccinated. Yes. Now, I, I mean, I have, a, you know, just really leading on from that, do you, can you tell us something about the length of immunity? If somebody's had COVID-19, um, are we saying that they are immune indefinitely for their lifetime? What, what, what's the science on that? Yeah, so of course, we, we've only known about this bug for less than six months. Um, so we can't say how long the immunity will last. Uh, but the, um, the knowledge we have from related viruses, so of course, the first time coronaviruses came to, to prominence um, was the SARS outbreak. Mm -hmm. um, so that's the severe acute respiratory syndrome coronavirus in 2003. Uh, and then, of course, in 2012, we had something called MERS, Middle East Respiratory Syndrome uh, coronavirus. Um, and both of those are, um, are related to the coronavirus, which is, is currently circulating. Uh, and we know from that, uh, from that experience, that immunity does develop. Um, and we know that that uh, immunity appears to be pretty robust for a year or so, perhaps even much, much longer. Um, and so people who had SARS um, back in 2003 have subsequently been re retested. Mm -hmm. uh, they've been challenged um, and they do produce an immune reaction where, when, when retested. Uh, the only real experience we have on protection from the, the current coronavirus, which is SARS coronavirus 2, um, is experiments in animal models, in baboons, I believe, mm -hmm. um, where they have um, exposed the animals, uh, the animals have generated a, a immunity, and then they have, they have re-exposed them. Um, and those animals have, uh, have been protected. Uh, but that's small, you know, obviously small populations of animals, very early experiments. Um, but I, I the evidence is that immunity will be protective. Um, we cannot yet say for how long that will last. Yes, eventually we will know the answer to that, but it's a work in progress. Yeah. So, so just there's a question here about ethnic minorities. Um, I mean, we know that 
the number of infections and the number of deaths and sickness have been much higher percentage-wise amongst the ethnic minorities and the Black and Asian community. Um, and this can be put down to lifestyle issues, not lifestyle, but um, you know the jobs they do and being in the NHS and the front line and all these all these all these uh, 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 works in our society, which you know have um, have really been in the front line. Yeah. Um, or it might be, I don't know, something to do with the, um, you know, genetic issues. I don't know. Are you able to say anything about that? Is it? Um, I'm more on the, we, we don't know. Um, I, I think um, you call it lifestyle. I mean, very broadly, lifestyle issues um, is more likely to be a factor than, um, uh, than is um, uh, some underlying genetic susceptibility. Um, and because the, the situation is, it, it's not just been seen in uh, the UK, it's been seen in the United States and el elsewhere as well. As well. Um, so um, factors that have been spoken about are um, multi-generational families living in the same house. Mm -hmm. um, so um, are, um, are people, are older people, being more likely to be exposed uh, if they live in a multi-generational family. That, that would definitely be a risk factor. Um, as you've mentioned already, the sort of work that um, um, people in the, uh, the, uh, the Black Nation and minority ethnic community do, are, are they more likely to work in public service jobs, uh, in the health service? Um, so, I, so my feeling is it's, it's got more to do than it with exposure uh, than, within, than with genetics. Um, I, I, I mean, obviously, there was um, a Public Health England report about, was it last week or the week before, um, about this, this very issue. Um, and they produced a lot of um, uh, data sort of measuring the problem, uh, but they didn't really talk about explanations whatsoever. Uh, and I, th I thought that was a, a, a disappointing part of that document. Mm -hmm. And a, a related question to that is from Yasmin Ransom, who's asking about the elderly. Uh, we've tended to think of the elderly as being 70 plus. I don't mm -hmm. know if that, that fits your criteria, but in, in terms of the elderly, obviously they are more vulnerable because of their mm -hmm. age um, and they need to be more cautious. Um, would you have any particular points to make for the elderly? I mean, maybe they yeah. need to be locked down longer, whatever it might be. I don't know if you've got any thoughts about that. Yeah, um, it is fascinating how the risk of dying from COVID maps um, on, on almost perfectly onto people's lifetime risk of dying. So, so, so think of it this way. If you are a, um, say, a, an eight-year-old child, then your risk of dying in, within the next year is, is minuscule. Um, I, I mean, our, our primary school children are probably the um, safest group of human beings that have ever lived. Mm -hmm. um, whereas obviously, if you're an 80 year old person, your risk of dying is much, much higher. It's actually about, uh, within the next year, it's actually about 15% if you're, eight, if you're 80 plus. Um, and it is remarkable how the risk from COVID maps directly onto that. So, um, so if you're an eight year old child, then double your risk of dying from COVID is essentially double nothing. Um, so it barely increases the risk of dying. Um, whereas if you're an 80 year old person, uh, then it doubles your risk of dying from 15% to 30% in the next year. Um, and it does that all in a, in a, in a really short space of time. So uh, it, it is fascinating and not yet ex fully explained uh, why this disease um, is, is particularly focused in, in elderly people. Um, there has been talk about um, the elderly, um, the advice about the elderly um, self-quarantine be, be, being relaxed. Um, I, I, I think that uh, the, the, the risk remains the same while we have widespread community transmission. And obviously that community transmission is coming down. So there has to come a point where the, the individual people must decide um, what, what is important for them. Right. Well, that's, um, that's very helpful. And I just wanted to uh, uh, take a question from uh, uh, somebody who's asking really about bus transport. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there seems to be a greater incidence of people uh, picking up the virus from traveling by bus as opposed to other 
forms of public transport. Is there any truth in that? I, I, I is that, does that sound plausible? Does our bus drivers, our bus drivers, have been badly affected? Oh yeah. Is there a difference between transmission rates on different modes of transport? That's the question. Yeah, um, I don't know, um, is, is the honest answer. Uh, I noticed, uh, I mean, I haven't been on the bus for a couple of months now, but I, mm. I noticed on, on buses that have more than one door is that you, uh, is that you now get in the back door, not, not the front door, presumably to, um, to reduce exposure um, of, of the drivers. Um, you, you, you can't untangle the um, exposure from life, lifestyle factors. Uh, of course, I mean, our bus drivers—you know—bus bus drivers have a sedentary lifestyle. Um, are they more likely to be overweight? Are they more likely to have hypertension? Are they more likely to have diabetes? Um, it, it's not easy to uh, to un untangle that uh, just from their their exposure mm -hmm. um, to to the to members of the public. Um, I uh, and bus drivers, of course, are wearing masks now, which is which I think is in, uh, in this particular case is 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 eminently sensible um, but if you think about it then the, the sort of exposure that we're talking about is not just a, a fleeting passing it's not just somebody standing next to you for a moment or two or even a minute or two or walk or, and then and then passing on uh, that we're, we're really talking about being in pretty close proximity to somebody probably for a few minutes um, and um, my experience as a regular user of, of, of public transport is that there is an awful lot of coming and going um, and mm. you don't really stand next to or sit next to people for very long, the same individual for very long. So I'm, I'm not sold on the argument that, um, that, that buses or tube trains are a particularly uh, high uh, exposure setting. Uh, your work setting is definitely a much, much higher exposure setting than is public transport. Very good. So one last question, and I'm going to wind up then because we're coming to the end. This is a question from Josh Nashar, who's asking, are home masks, I presume she means homemade masks, mm. are, they, are they sufficient or are we obliged to go out and buy the, the real McCoy from wherever? <laughs> Well, I think I think the government advice is that we're supposed to wear what we're uh, they're calling these three ply masks. Mm -hmm. um, so the, these are proper, properly designed and manufactured sur surgical masks. Um, I think, in the absence of anything else, um, then, then the homemade mask is is all right. Uh, but it's it's um, uh, and again, I've got to add the caveat here that the you know the level of evidence is is poor all round. Um, but the of course the, they get uh, homemade masks. Um, are quickly become very damp um, and all you're doing r r really is you're just capturing the virus if you are expressing virus uh, you're just capturing the virus in this this warm damp environment um, and probably helping keeping it alive for a bit longer uh, and then what do you do you know what do you do with it you, you touch it when you take it off well that's not that's not a problem for you um, because you've already got the virus but if you put it down on the surface and then somebody very quickly comes along and touches that surface um, then uh, th th that's not a barrier to transmission. So, so th there is absolutely no substitute for um, when it is doable for, for physical distancing, um, for hand hygiene, um, and for this sort of you know, respiratory et etiquette. If, you, if you're coughing at all or, or sneezing or whatever, then d do it into the crook of your elbow. Uh, and I, I, I really don't want people to start using masks as a panacea uh, against those more, uh, as opposed to those those more fundamental um, uh, interventions. Fantastic. Now, I'd just like to do two things before we finish off. Can we take that poll again? Do you think, uh, Sanani, if you can put up the poll, it's pretty much the same question about masks, which uh, I'd like to see whether we've shifted the opinion of that 40% who said that they wouldn't. So while you're answering that, um, I wanted to put, John, one final question, and while you're thinking about the answer to that question, to thank you. So the question which I'm going to ask you, and, and forgive me, this question is coming from the audience, by the way, it says, if, if you were UK Prime Minister, what would you do now to reduce daily confirmed cases and daily death rates? So that's yeah. the question for you. But before you answer, to give you time to mm -hmm. think, if you need to think, I just, I just want to <laughs> say, John, how delighted we are, first of all, that you have come forward on this webinar uh, as uh, such an important person at this time. And, uh, you know, you've done it for us totally gratis, pro bono, 
uh, for the benefit of our audience, for the benefit of our institutions. And we really can't thank you enough for having come forward for that. The impression I got from feedback seen on the questions is that it's been tremendously enjoyable and we've really enjoyed having you on. So you now have about, well, less than one minute to tell us what you would do if you were UK Prime Minister. Well, if I was if I was thinking in a sort of Machiavellian Boris way, then I um, to reduce the number of cases, I would do less tests, uh, because the fewer tests you do, the the, f the fewer confirmed positives you get. Um, <laughs> however, <laughs> however, um, you can't hide the deaths. You can't hide the deaths, and the, I think the deaths is a is a better marker uh, of a of a real um, uh, of of the the real epidemic situation than, than is the number of tests tests, which is incredibly subject to. Uh, sorry, the number of cases, which is incredibly subject to the number of tests you do. Um, I would be, um, um, I, I would be still be paying particular attention to the uh, the care home community. Um, I would be taking a punt um, on investing on um, back in vaccines. Uh, I know we've put money in it already, uh, but I'd be thinking about where we can direct our resources to invest. Uh, to, to, to make sure that not just the UK, but as many countries as, the, as we can help has vaccine available. Because even if we make it go away in the UK, uh, we are a global hub. We are one of the most connected countries in the world. Uh, and if we don't um, bring this d disease down to a manageable level in the rest of the world, then it is going to be reintroduced and we will have new hotspots, new outbreaks. Um, uh, and I would also be my planning for easing of lockdown would be a a um, would be um, transparent, and it would be not trying to do too many things at the same time. Very good. Thank you very much indeed. So now, do we have the poll result? I think we can leave everybody on that note. Oh my goodness, me! Look at Ooh. that. So we're saying that eighty-eight percent now are 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 are. Um, determined to wear a face mask in an enclosed space. So that's very good news. Um, and uh, I just want to extend my thanks again to you, John. Oh. Enjoy the rest of the evening. And Thank you. Uh, I'm sure that people will enjoy listening to it. It's available on recording. Thank you. I just say that, uh, that you've, I, I, I seem to have convinced our audience to wear a face mask, even though until very recently, I myself was very skeptical about them. <laughs> that was WHO. Okay. <laughs> yes. Thank you very much indeed to everybody. Thank, Thank you, everyone. Thank you for participating. Goodbye. Goodbye.